I may not be Al Gore, but I'm going to talk about something kind of futuristic -y that probably doesn't exist. Um, no, I, I actually believe in global warming. But um, what is the Internet of Things? Actually, like global warming, um, it's kind of this amorphous thing where you ask somebody and you get six different answers. Um, so I'm going to start with a simple definition. Here are some things. Um, a car is a thing. Um, and it turns out that now cars are increasingly sophisticated. So actually, um, numerous manufacturers are starting to embed um, JavaScript applications, HTML5 applications into the cars, browsers, all kinds of things. Cars are getting cell phones inside them. And I mean, this may include kind of high-end things like Mercedes, but also all the way down to um, things like Toyotas and um, Scions and all these kinds of things. Um, cars are getting way more connected. But I'm not just talking about that. I'm also talking about the fact that if you buy the average modern car, it has dozens of computers in it. And when you press the accelerator, that's computer. When you brake, that's also a computer. All of these things are run by computers, so the car knows how much it's braking. So imagine a world where we could actually start to look at where people were braking on our roads, figure out where the black spots were, aggregate that data, and say, well, maybe we need to change this road here because people keep braking a lot, and that's what's causing accidents. So this is Internet of Things. Um, bikes. Right? Cars are kind of expensive, but in London, you can get a bike with a GPS, with a credit card, and if you try and steal the bike, they start to lock the bike off and it stops working. So there's all these kinds of things, and these schemes are all over the world. Right? So even cheaper transport like bikes. Um, let's pick something that you'd never kind of think, that's high tech. Benches. Um, this is a, a nice public space. People are sort of sitting watching um, some city that I don't know because I just got the photo off the internet. And if anybody recognizes that skyline, please tell me later. Um, but this is, you know, this is a really interesting place for people to sit. How do people that work in public service, how do they know how useful that infrastructure is? How do they figure out how many people sit on benches? Where's the best place to put a bench? Where's the right um, combination of seating? How many people use this? Did the bench get graffitied? All of these questions are interesting questions. And the idea of the Internet of Things is suddenly it may be possible for us to start connecting devices, all kinds of devices. Um, people sometimes talk about IPv6. Um, obviously, we've now run out of IPv4 addresses. All of those have been assigned. They've all taken. The pool is gone. And people talk about IPv6. Why is it important? Well, I want to have light bulbs that I can connect to via the Internet. Um, and this is actually kind of interesting. I mean, like, think about the amount of just simple lighting that we use, and if we had control of that. If I, if I left home now, and all of my lights were connected to the internet, I could be like, oh, I left the lights on, turn them off. Those lights do not need to be running all day. So there's all these kinds of things that we can do. Um, so why is this happening now? Well, the obvious thing is the rise of the CPU. Um, everybody's heard of Moore's Law, I assume. Um, this is Moore's Law. Um, the, the basic idea is obviously starting in the you know, uh, 1970s is when they sort of started uh, counting this graph, but um, every 18 months, computing power doubles. So the amount of available power is doubling every 18 months. Um, and this is kind of typified by the fact that um, just the amount of computing power that we sent to the moon is significantly less than just the amount in your cell phone. Right? It's, I mean, it's massively, massively less. Um, and you know, we have other things that are really contributing to this, the rise of the network. So um, you may not have heard of this, but Nielsen's law, Nielsen's the usability guy, um, and he basically came up with this prediction, which kind of holds true, which is that bandwidth to the consumer increases by roughly 50% each year. So you can see that um, on this graph. Um, this is uh, Cisco. So Cisco plot the amount of mobile data that people are using. So this is not broadband data, this is mobile data. Um, and you can see that uh, year on year, they're uh, predicting that it's going to be something like 10 exabytes. So that's a very big number um, by 2016. Now, the third part of if we want to put internet in absolutely everything, the third part is batteries. So obviously, the rise of the ba oh, the batteries are crap. Batteries are terrible. <laughs> it's, it's true. And this is actually, did anybody ever get one of those free from like Google? Google I.O. gave everybody one of those. Uh, what was it? It was it, whatever it was with a massive screen and it had like 4G, and everybody's like, yes, finally, 4G and this huge screen. And then they used it for two hours and were sad. Um, and that was basically this is the problem. So uh, batteries have not been doubling every 10 years, in fact, uh, every uh, 18 months. In fact, um, it's taken almost 20 years to double battery capacity. And this is by weight. 
but um, by weight, it's taken almost 10 years to double battery capacity. So batteries are really holding us back a lot. We do have one savior, which is Kumi's law. So basically, Kumi predicted um, that the amount of power that computers would use would drop in half every 18 months. So it's kind of the inverse of, of Moore's law. All right, so I'm gonna have to go fast so we don't run out of time. But um, basically, we have these different things. So processors faster and cheaper, network faster and cheaper, batteries and meh. So how does this apply? Well, network is the most draining thing when we're doing mobile computing. CPU is the second most drain. So if we have a thing like this, um, we've got a range of things that we need in order to do internet things. Um, sensors um, are extremely prolific with data. Sensors just bath data. Um, think of like an analog uh, source or something, an analog uh, sounds or whatever. It's just bathing data constantly. It then hits the device, and we can start to filter that sound down and send it over the internet. On the flip side, you know, a big data center, lots of cheap free power, lots of cheap computing, putting computing and putting power on this little device in a chair, solar power, whatever it is, really difficult. So this is where Java st starts to come in. Um, we want to narrow down that, that beam of focus. Um, we can imagine, I mean, like, to, to give this some context, hello, I'm a chair, still a chair. Um, I'm still a chair. So keep bathing data doesn't actually do anything useful. Right? It just doesn't actually help us um, by doing that. It's just barfing data at a server makes, makes no difference. So we want to minimize the amount of data, but maximize usefulness. Um, and this is where event-driven programming comes in. And JavaScript is the most popular language for event-driven programming. So um, this is you know, the one line of code in my presentation. Um, object are on event, function callback data stuff. This is, this is the sort of canonical. I mean, I write lots of node code, but this is the canonical way that we do this. Um, and this is how JavaScript really helps. So here's our light bulb. Oh, it got dark. What do I do? Can you turn yourself on? Sure, I turn myself on. By turning this into events, instead of dark, 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 light, 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 um, we actually have much greater control and much greater efficiency. We can say, turn yourself off. And yes, I turn myself off. So it really is about data in um, and out and commands in and out and using events to really do that. So, Processing on the device reduces the transmitted data um, by only sending interesting events. So we only send things that we care about. Um, and we can reduce the cost of uh, listening on the devices by using events. And that's a more complex topic. Um, finally, JavaScript's really interesting because it is so dynamic. Some of the stuff that Brennan was showing um, really emphasizes like, how we can actually like, update devices. So if you've ever tried to do Arduino, in order to update an Arduino, you have to do it over the USB. If we run JavaScript programs on devices, that is no longer true. Um, so Internet of Things for you. If you want to get started with this, um, Texas Instruments make this great thing called a BeagleBone. Um, it's a small Linux. It ships with Node and Cloud9 on the device. You plug it in. You immediately have a browser with an editor, and you can start writing Node programs that interact with all those Arduino kinds of things. Really cool. Um, and there's a Kickstarter, which is actually based on BeagleBone, um, called NinjaBlocks. And um, they basically made a bunch of pre-built sensors that easily plug into the Ninja blocks. The Kickstarter's ended, but you can go and buy them anyway. Um, and then they have a cloud service that you can also connect to. So these are the two easiest ways to kind of apply this in principle. Um, and that's it. So thank you very much. Um, and. Oh.